Hello and welcome to News Tonight on Sign Languages Mugalu Mohammed. I am Rod Ngonzi. Let's take a look at our top stories for the night. Notorious Boda Boda 2010 patron Chitacha sentenced breaks down in tears. The UPDF capacity and capability growing steadily according to Minister for Defence. MPs condole with Minister Chibule on twins' death. While Africa improves on aviation security and safety. And China hits back in trade war with the US. Maggie. Hello once again. The Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development in partnership with Uganda Revenue Authority and the Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group officially launched the National Budget Month today. Some of the objectives discussed include rebranding the ministry's image and articulating the services that the ministry offers, uh, increasing capability publicity for the national budget through increased stakeholder participation and improving accountability and service delivery through promotion of budget transparency activities. Here is more on that. You know, hitting the target, actually we are achieving beyond the target which we set ourselves. Now, of course, as the media uh, and of course as civil society, would also be interested in getting your feedback because uh, there are quite a number of projects which are implemented and this is actually the partnership we want. So we want you also uh, on your own initiatives actually to go out in the public and find out what extent the projects which we pronounce are being implemented. On our side we definitely have a monitoring unit and we, are, we follow up on each of these projects and we know a number of these projects are definitely being implemented and they, we, 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 we are definitely sure that by the end of the financial year many of these projects will, be, will have been accomplished. These kind of changes in the budgets, especially for members of parliament, demoralizes the rest of the civil servants who actually access money from the consultant fund. I mean, we have our teachers, we have our soldiers, we have our medical personnel, teachers are on strike. We have our interns in Morago who are always asking for 600,000 shillings a month. And, 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 and really, I think, in terms of our civil service morale, this definitely decreases the morale. Uh, lastly, is that when you look at this kind of allocation, 63.4 billion, for us when we were calculating, we found out actually that on an average an MP is going to get 140 million extra for this financial year. Now, how many of those other things are we missing out? How many unfunded priorities in this country do we have that we have not put resources simply because we don't have, we don't have, the, we don't have the money? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, I think your question has come at the right time. You remember we had strategies that we have laid out for the next financial year, and those were some of the strategies that were left in the previous financial year. So when you achieve a growth rate of about 6 7%, it, it's an indication that those strategies that have been put in place are actually the right ones. Hence, uh, the budget is actually meeting its, uh, its objectives and target. Population is a factor. Growth of the economy is yet another. If the economy grows, let's say at 7 8%, and the population grows at the rate of 3%, in net terms, probably the growth we are looking is about 4%. So, yes, that's the target that we wish as a country. But certainly, there are certain other factors that must be uh, taken into consideration when you are, uh, when you are computing the middle income status. Because when you talk about middle income status, that figure of $1,000 is GDP divided by the population. Remember, we have in our, in our budget, a uh, framework paper, we lay strategies in terms of how to grow the economy. And one of them is to achieve a, tax, a growth of uh, GDP growth of about 7%. So to be able to underpin that, you need to put up strategies that will help us to drive the economy. And one of them, of course, is that you need to focus on those uh, growth sectors, such as agriculture, the services sector, agro-processing, um, of course, infrastructure, which is very, very important. And, 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 uh, and all that 
because it leads into the growth of the economy. So that's why we have this. Let's head to the General Court Martial, uh, which has sentenced former Boda Boda 2010 patron Abdullah Chitata to a jail time of close to nine years after he was convicted of two counts on Monday. Chitata, together with his bodyguard Ngobi Soweli, was found guilty of unlawful possession of firearms plus 50 rounds of ammunition, which items are a monopoly of the Uganda People's Defence Forces. The journey of a legal battle in which former Boda Boda 2010 patron Haj Abdul Chitata was accused of, among others, unlawful possession of submachine gun, three pistols, and 50 rounds of live ammunition has left the self proclaimed might in Arem Kada on his knees. The general court martial has sentenced Abdul Chitata and his bodyguard, So Ngobi, to eight years in jail for illegal possession of firearms and ammunition. The general court martial chairman, Lieutenant General Andrew Gotti, delivered the judgment in the Makindia based court that was full to capacity this morning. This court hereby sentenced you as follows One, Haji Kitat Habudala A1 to eight years, eight months, and six days imprisonment on count three, and eight years, eight months, and six days imprisonment on count five, sentences to run concurrently. Bit by bit, General Guti explained the factors that court relied on to come up with a decision that in a minute brought a dark cloud cover over Chitata's life. General Guti said, Court had considered the mitigation factors raised by the defense lawyer, Shaban Sanywa, and submissions by the prosecutor, Lieutenant Colonel Rafael Mujisha, and found a sentence of eight years, eight months, and six days appropriate for each of their two offenses. He also said court considered 15 months and some days the convict spent on remand, the fact that they did not have criminal records and that they are sole breadwinners of their families. According to Guti, court also considered the fact that the guns recovered from the convicts were never used to commit any crime. For that there is no proof that the guns were involved in any crime. On Ongovi, Guti said, court considered the fact that he has served the country diligently as a detective in Uganda police force. Prosecution had asked court to give the convicts the maximum sentence so as to deter other people from committing such crimes which have of late become rampant in society. Chitata, who looked composed in the dock together with Ngovi, broke down in tears when the judgment was translated to Uganda. <laughs> The sentencing of the duo follows their conviction on Monday after the military court found Chitata and Ngobi guilty of unlawful possession of firearms and ammunition. Chitata was convicted for illegal possession of a golden pistol and ammunition, while Ngobi was convicted for unlawful possession of a submachine gun with a fully loaded magazine. However, this was a bitter pill for the relatives and friends of the convicts to swallow. The defense was as well shocked as it expressed disappointment with the court's decision to which they promised an appeal. And as I talk now, we have strict instructions to immediately file a notice of appeal. We are going to General Court Martial Appeal Court against the conviction and sentence. Court has found that it is deserving for Abdul Chitata to serve a 10 year imprisonment. However, after deducting the time he has spent on remand, it has decided to award him 8 years, 8 months, and 6 days on imprisonment. However, his defense team wants to appeal. It remains to be seen whether that will yield anything tangible.
Dokas Kimono, UBC TV News. Still, the military court has sentenced one of their own, James Wandera, UPDF officer, to a two-year jail term after it was established that he fell short of his lawful mandate of protecting war materials. This was after prosecution proved beyond reasonable doubt that Lance Corporal Wandera unlawfully took with him two pistols to use to protect his wife. On conviction, the maximum sentence would have been a death sentence, though court preferred a two-year jail term on grounds that Wandera was a first-time offender with no criminal record. After deducting one year and 13 days spent on remand, this court here by sentence you, RIA, 21800 Lance Corporal Wandera James to two years imprisonment on count one and to two years imprisonment on count two and two years imprisonment on count three. Sentences to run concurrently. We so rule. You have a right to appeal within 14 days if we are not satisfied with the sentence of this court. Next. Now, uh, over 2,000 people have been diagnosed and treated for different ailments from a three-day medical camp organized by Zappa Foundation in conjunction with the Office of the Vice President in Amuru District. The medical camp held at Rot Santo Richard's grounds in Atiyaka in Amuru District registered a high prevalence of hepatitis, malaria, and eye infections among the people who registered and were screened for various ailments. Out of the 250 people who were screened for malaria, 195 were found positive. Of 123 screened for hepatitis, 75 were found positive, while for 114 who were tested for HIV-12 were found positive and 600 presented skin diseases while 356 people were treated for STDs. The mobile medical camp that was opened by the Vice President Edward Shuanuka Sekandi over the weekend attracted over 200 South Sudan nationals, mainly women and children. During the same time, 63 eye operations were carried out and adjusted 234 patients with high figures, fevers rather, cough and flu in the three days. The Vice President has directed the respective departments of government to look at the statistics critically and offer the necessary intervention, saying some of the figures, especially for HIV AIDS, eyes and hepat eyes infections and hepatitis B infections were of constant and need urgent attention across the country. Now, Uganda is to join the rest of the world to commemorate the World Family Day 2019. Minister for State of State for Gender and Culture, Peace Matuzo, says the celebrations due tomorrow will focus on the role of families and family policies dedicated to promotion of the peaceful and inclusive society for sustainable development. Matuzo, who was addressing journalists at the Media Center, says the celebrations will be marked in Bududa District provides the first administrative justice to children and members of the family. The government of Uganda created a unit for family affairs in the Ministry of General Labor and Social Development, but also at police there is a, a family protection unit and we also have family courts uh, within the judiciary. The existing government programs to address family issues include Uganda Women Entrepreneurship Program, where government has put in place some resource envelope to support women and get economic empowerment, sustain their families and the well-being. The Youth Livelihood Fund also supports the young women and men who would wish to start up businesses and various enterprises on their own without necessarily going to borrow from the bank. An advanced team has been in Bududa from the Ministry of General Labor and Social Development conducting preliminary activities including community dialogue, 
that have gone on very successful at Nangoka Town, Town Council Hall since the other week. The provision of access to justice for all and the establishment of effective accountability and inclusive institutions at all levels. The significance of the theme is that peace starts with individuals as a state of a mind, a perspective, a way of life, all things modeled in the family. In the family, we are tested, our patience, our emotions can be pushed to their limits. And through such experiences, we learn that our connections to each other and you are beyond differences. The Ministry of Defence and Veteran Affairs says it has so far implemented 70% of the NRM manifesto, commitments, strategic guidelines and directives of 2016. Updating the media at the office of the Prime Minister in Kampala during the manifesto week activities, Defence Minister Adolf Wesige also revealed that security agencies have grown in capacity and currently meet the needs to sustain peace and security in the country. The security sector was identified in the NRM manifesto as a pillar in achieving the aspirations of the party. For this to be achieved, strategic guidelines and directives were laid out. We were instructed to relocate the Air Force from Entebbe to Nakasongola, which, as you know, is more spacious. We were instructed to make adequate provision for classified expenditure as a government, to get more funding for development of lawyer industries. This is essentially defense industries, which is managed by NEC, the National Enterprise Corporation, which is the business arm of the Uganda People's Defense Forces. Updating the media during the manifesto week activities at the office of the Prime Minister, Defense Minister Adolf Mwesige, was pleased to note that a lot has been achieved in this regard. So in Uganda, the NRM is, a, is, a, is a very visionary. We foresaw all this and we cannot allow to expose our people and our resources to threats which we can predict. So, yes, there is total peace in Uganda. I say that without fear of contradiction. Total peace. But our preparedness to sustain this peace must continue. On the issue of professionalizing the army, it was noted that the ministry has continued to train and retrain the force in relevant courses for skills development and knowledge acquisition. The ministry is also constructing a 250-bed military referral hospital to handle those medical cases that cannot be handled within UPDF health centers. We are trying to minimize on referrals of uh, patients who cannot be managed internally. So this is why we have been sending some of our soldiers outside Uganda uh, for treatment. So in setting up this referral hospital, it is going to cater for so many cancer patients whom we have been referring, uh, kidney issues, uh, heart issues, heart conditions. With the absence of wars and hostilities, the UPDF is now more effectively engaged in primary, secondary and industrial production, initially for internal consumption within the sector and later for commercial purposes. We have uh, been engaging in production already, productive activities already under NEC, and NEC has many subsidiaries, has a number of subsidiaries, including Nech Katonga Farm, which is a breeding ground for beef cattle for, for, for commercial purposes. We have Nech Tractors, higher scheme. We also have Luero Industries, which produces a number of, of items. Going forward, the Ministry of Defense plans to strengthen the internal and external security sectors by enhancing information collection and analysis capabilities to ensure a peaceful and secure Uganda. Samuel Senono. UBC News.
Now, the Minister of State for Water, Ronald Chibule, has exhibited rather a high level of courage following the death of his two-year-old twins who drowned in a swimming pool at his home in Mokono. While speaking to mourners after a funeral service for the deceased, Chibule said people should not politicize the death of his children because it was an accident and fate. And may their souls rest in peace. That aside, members of parliament have expressed the need to limit access of children to domestic facilities that may lead to unbearable effects, including death. The MPs want fences installed around swimming pools to ensure safety of children living near such facilities. Former leader of opposition, Winfred Kiza, uh, echoed this with regard to the disaster that befell the family of the State Minister for Water, Ronald Chimule. Chairperson, Parliamentary Forum on Children, Bernard Atiku, also condoled with the bereaved family. Chimule lost his twin children, his, uh, twin children after they drowned in a swimming pool at their home. First of all, I convey my apologies to our colleague, condolences to the family. It is so hurting and so painful. Home accidents are common. I remember I also became a victim of a home accident. My niece died from the burns of a gas cooker. And what has happened to our colleague is so sad because I know what it means to lose children and in your own home where we think our children should be safe where we think the children should find happiness and sometimes we do all we do to ensure that our children are happy many times we believe the the maids or the housekeepers or the watchmen are there to watch over our children but we forget that uh, there are a lot of uh, environmental hazards that we expose our children to. A swimming pool is one of those uh, uh, dangers or dangerous features we have on our compounds, in our vicinity or around us. It's unfortunate that the happiness the parent wanted to create for his children it's the same thing that has caused them death. However, I would advise that possibly those with similar facilities should have a face around the facility so that children do not find their way there without an adult who will have guided them to the facility, who will have guided them to that place of recreation. such a tragedy and may their souls rest in peace this tuesday in our health breader we took we take rather a look at the care and common disorders that affect our ears ears are important parts on our bodies because they help in hearing and therefore ease communication and interaction. The ears have three major parts, outer, middle and inner, all used for hearing. However, there are some conditions that can affect the ears and lead to hearing loss. But how big is this problem? On average, if you see, let me say, about 50 patients, you are going to have at least 10 to 15 of those having hearing problems. Yeah, it's a big problem. Some people are born when they are deaf, while others just acquire the condition due to infections, exposure to too much noise, accidents which damage the ears, and use of some medication. Some conditions can be corrected and one can regain their hearing ability, while others are not. Once hearing loss comes by sound, it's a permanent loss. The only thing we can do is to offer a hearing aid that can improve somebody's hearing. However, some human actions like use of earphones and headphones can lead to hearing loss. When they are put in the ear, they create a humid environment. 
and that humid environment encourages the growth of fungus so that they end up uh, with a fungal infection. Uh, then those same hearing, uh, the, the, the headphones, they can give a lot of sound to the ear and too much exposure to loud sound can cause hearing loss. Also, inappropriate cleaning of the ears can lead to hearing loss. The ears clean themselves. There is no need of cleaning the ears. The wax is made from deep in the canal. It migrates out slowly. And uh, when you are bathing, you use your finger to clean out what has reached the outside. Uh, there is no need to use those earbuds. When we use earbuds, they actually push back the wax and eventually it gets impacted and these are the people who come to us for ear syringing, for ear cleaning. The wax that people tend to remove is rather important for the ears because it stops dust and other harmful particles from entering the ear canal. Here are some of the ways to care for the ears. Keep your ears dry by gently cleaning with a towel after bathing or swimming to prevent moisture that can allow bacteria. Avoid use of cotton swabs to clean the ears. Use earplugs while in areas with excessive noise. Adiana Kute, UBC. Now, before we shared a very uh, touching story of Minister of State for Water, Ronald Chibule, who has, uh, who's, who has lost his twin sons. But today he exhibited a high level of courage following the death of his two-year-old who drowned in a swimming pool at his home in Mukono. While speaking to mourners after a funeral service for the deceased, Chibule said people should not politicize the death of his children because it was an accident and fate. A sombre mood engulfed the home of Salongo Ronald and Nalongo Fortin Chibule in Mukono as mourners flocked the compound to bid condolences and stand with the family in the time of mourning their twins. Tents have been erected in Minister Chibule's compound to accommodate the big numbers of mourners ranging from ministers, members of parliament, local leaders, friends to family members. Different people came out with words of encouragement to the parents of the deceased, advising them to put their hope in God who gave and has taken away. <laughs> After a funeral service led by Reverend Canon Paji David of St. Andrew Church, Mukono Diocese, where they also prayed for the parents of the deceased for God to strengthen them, Minister Chibule got the courage to speak to mourners circumstances that surrounded the death of his twins. <laughs> Although he said it was fate, she would emphasize the twins were a unique gift from God and can only meet them when he becomes born again. Thank <laughs> you. 
Kato and Waswa were only two years old and learning to speak at the time of their death. Their bodies will be laid to rest at their ancestral home in Mukono Kapeke tomorrow. May their souls rest in eternal peace. I'm Nafka Farida, reporting. <coughs> Indeed, may their souls rest in peace. The Commission of Inquiry into Land Matters has learned that Mukono Registrar of Titles, Ms. Loera uh, Taro, picked documents regarding the acquisition of Kayunga Forest Reserves. This was discovered while quizzing the former Secretary District Land Board, Kayunga, Robert M Mbazira, in regards to the attainment of over 40 land titles in Chiwulu. I beg your pardon, Chiwulula, uh, Bajo, and Wamale uh, forest reserves in Garidaya, sub county. The former secretary, Kayunga District Land Board, Robert Mbazira, has presented to the Commission of Inquiry into Land Matters inconsistent files in regard to information asked from him. If you can have an oversight on things as important as your own personal document, how much oversight should we expect in land issues, which are actually even more delicate? Mbazira was summoned to explain the acquisition of land by Kayunga Sugar Works in the forest reserves. According to Mbazira, Kayunga Forest Reserves land has been lost to individuals. Yes, Do you think there is any more land left in the forest? I don't know how big the forest is, but uh, it seems it's as if uh, the, uh, this is a vast land. It's a very, very big land. I doubt there is any part left. He informed commissioners that the land in contestation was never inspected. The contested land was inspected by the land inquiry team and discovered that over 2,000 acres had been encroached upon by private individuals and GM Sugar Company. However, Mukono Registrar's action of keeping all documents regarding the forest reserves acquisition raised questions. Did you say that what you have on record right now in the EMSO in Mukono yes, is that Miss Ataro? Yes has gone and picked original files. Or really because, as she said, she has been asked to present the same files before this commission, madam. And uh, she's not appearing any time this week, as far as I know. Well, not someone has said, my lord. Well, not. So how does she pick originals, take them out of the system, and what did they use to photocopy for you then? The commission is still investigating this matter. Sudat Kaye, UBC. We return and with me in studio, I will be joined by Chairman of Soroti Catholic Diocese Association, that's Professor Godfrey Akilang. Akilang. Uh, we will be talking about the organization of a new bishop in Soroti. Every dream has a challenging journey. Ours began in 1998 with a mission to drive the development of a robust communications sector in Uganda we created structures to champion the dream we've evolved made discoveries supported great minds empowered Ugandans and fostered a vibrant culture enabling communication for all down the years We've created memories and networks, uniting generations and building great partnerships. Together, we can go even further. UCC, celebrating 20 years of achievements. The National Environment Management Authority, NEMA, invites the general public to review and scrutinize the environmental and social impact assessment report for the proposed Kingfisher Development Project. The project involves the development of the Kingfisher Oil Field located in Chikube District and feeder pipeline transporting crude oil to the delivery point in Kavale in Hoima District. The major components of the project include oil production and water injection wells, central processing facility, floor lines, water obstruction station, feeder pipeline, and supporting infrastructure. Copies of the report are available at the following locations.
Written comments should be addressed to the Executive Director, National Environment Management Authority, Ginger Road, Kampala, by 15th May 2019. NEMA, ensuring sustainable development. Welcome back. Uh, you're still watching News Tonight. Now with me in studio is Chairman of Soroti Catholic Diocese Association. That's Professor Godfrey Ekelang. Uh, the diocese will be consecrating a new bishop. Welcome to uh, the program. Thank you very much. So tell us a bit about this consecration. Who is the bishop, the bishop-elect, and who is he replacing? Her bishop-elect is uh, Joseph Oliach Echiro mm. is currently a professor at National Seminary Gaba mm. and he also the chaplain of Soroti Catholic Diocese Laity Association, mm. Christians of Soroti Catholic Diocese who stay and live in, here in Kampala. Mm. He is replacing Archbishop Emmanuel Obo, who has been the apostolic administrator of the diocese. Mm. What's so special about the new? What's unique? about the new uh, bishop and maybe as you tell us that uh, you could just delve into this diocese yes what's unique it's about the, uh, mm. unique about the new bishop is is a gentleman with so many firsts he's the first uh, native priest from Soroti Catholic Diocese to be elected to the office of Episcopy mm. in Soroti Catholic Diocese. Mm. He's also the first uh, student of St. Peter's Minor Seminary Manera in Soroti Catholic Diocese to become a bishop. Okay. He's also the first uh, student of Major Seminary Kenyamasika to be elected a bishop. Um, Soroti Catholic Diocese um, was erected in 1981 previously it was under Tororo Diocese mm. and at that time the ordinary of Tororo Diocese is the Emeritus Archbishop James Odongo and our first Bishop of Soroti Catholic Diocese is Emeritus um, Bishop Erasmus Desiderius Wandera and after that in 2007 Bishop Wandera retired mm. and current, uh, the current Archbishop of Tororo uh, Emmanuel Obo was appointed the Bishop of Soroti mm. and in 2014 January 2nd he was elevated to the office of the Archbishop of Tororo and therefore Soroti uh, Diocese became vacant but we remained under the administrator and the administrator was um, Emmanuel Obo, the Archbishop of Tororo. So Bishop-elect is the third Bishop, bishop elect for is the, the Diocese? Yes please. Oh. Bishop uh, Joseph Echiro will be our third Bishop of Soroti Catholic Diocese. Okay, yes. so when is this event? When is the consecration? The consecration will take place on May the 25th, uh, 2019. Actually, I, I think uh, less than two weeks from now. Sure. And it will take place at Immaculate Conception Cathedral mm. at Soroti Town. Now, I understand uh, such putting up such events is, of course, costly. Yes, please. Tell us about how the fundraising is going how much of the more than 400 million have you uh, been able to garner for this? I, um, the budget is about 400 million shillings and um, we appeal to all people of goodwill in this country, in Uganda, and Soroti Catholic Diocese and Toro Ecclesiastical Province and whoever can be in position to help to support the fundraising drive. There are meetings for the fundraising that take place in Soroti. There are those also that take place here yeah. in Kampala. And we have been meeting every Wednesday at National Theatre Gardens to try to generate some uh, resources to fund these activities. And this week we shall be meeting on Thursday at 5.30 at the National Theatre Gardens again to try and generate some resources. Um, also on Sunday, the 19th of May, we shall be having um, a Thanksgiving and fundraising event at St. Gonza Gagonza mm -hmm. uh, Catholic Church in Kireka. Mm -hmm. Mass will start at 11 o'clock in the morning and where we hope to generate some resources. Mm -hmm. As you may realize, uh, you know, find funding these activities is not an easy thing, so I will not be definite to tell you how much we have so far collected. Mm -hmm. But what I know is that the budget is still big mm -hmm. and it requires some substantive amounts for us to, go to, to, to support this occasion. This occasion brings many people. 
mm -hmm. it's going to bring all the bishops of Uganda, Uganda Episcopal Conference. It's also going to bring many people from this country and beyond. As mm -hmm. just I've told you, the, the bishop elect has been a formator for many years. Yes. So he has his students who are priests, uh, who are serving in dioceses across this country. They will be coming to Soroti. All people of goodwill from all the various dioceses in this country will be visiting us in Soroti mm -hmm. and attending his consecration. So we expect many people to come to Soroti. And we appeal to all people of goodwill to come forward and support us. We wish you nothing but the best in this. Thank you very much. All right. Let's take a quick break. We'll return with more details. Let's continue. Women activists under their umbrella body, Women's Organization Network for Human Rights Advocacy, have urged the government to strengthen awareness campaigns against HIV and AIDS. Following the report findings by the body, many uh, women like single mothers, maids, uh, sex workers, disadvantaged girls are still at the verge of contracting and spreading the virus. The research findings carried out by Wanetha indicate that several groups of disadvantaged women are still getting HIV infections following several challenges they go through. Although government has put in place a number of interventions like awareness creations, there are still gaps of untold stories of disadvantaged women like single mothers. The research reveals that many people are still living in hiding because of stigma, which has fueled the spread of new infections. There is more discussion about the fact that there should be uh, <coughs> services, they are still uh, facing certain um, challenges accessing them. According to Rosemary Kabugo, there is still a group of people who cannot access health facilities either for testing or treatment. She says this can be dealt with by putting in place health communities to work hand in hand with the government in creating awareness. The communications director, Wanetha, Diana Natkunda, has challenged key groups to uphold morals and help government fight the spread of new infections. They are targeting the real population and they have specific messages on HIV or violations and all these are critical areas that as civil societies and the government need to look at. Women still remain in the risky zone of acquiring HIV AIDS as compared to their male counterparts. Story compiled by Kenneth Tanaba. For UBC News. As we plan to celebrate Uganda Matters Day next month, we have started unveiling profiles of matters. Joseph Mukasa Balikudembe was the first matter who died because of his Christian faith. That's on November 1885. In November, rather, 1885. As we plan to celebrate Uganda Matters Day next month, we have started with unveiling to you the profile of each matter starting from the history of their birth throughout life. Joseph Mukasabali Kudembe was the first matter who died because of his faith in Jesus Christ in the Catholic religion on November 1885. He was a Muganda by tribe from Springbo clan family of antelopes. His father was Njube Seta, while his mother, Maria Sara Kajwayo Amotoro from Fort Poto, Kawalore district. He grew up in a family of Kabazi. He was loved by the Kabaka Mukabia to the extent that he would not do anything without consulting from Balikudembe. 
He was named Balikudembe by the Kabaka himself. He first prayed at Makay in the Protestants. Erebi mwe byamusa byali byakukiriza nga agamba kabaka nti omusajjoyo tomuta kubanga tayina musango omusajjoyo bamutira busoga sajjono bamuitanga Huntington na ye kabaka na gamba sagala kunda bamukamwa obanga chichicho yagala kunda bamukamwa namgamba bagende bakute sajjono Yosefu mukasa bali kudembe yali musajja mukiriza era na gama saba sajja bwichibanga bwosimye kale chikolebwe ne bamuleta e, na kuzo mwezi ali 15 mwezi gwali gwa November 2018 chinana mweta najja natirwa wano mu kisenyi wano wenyine we yatirwa musayi gwene guyika ne kabaka yali amwagala nnyo era yali amuddemu ne bagenda okujja Bambi basanga ba mazo kumota ngo musayi ba mazo kuguyiwa eranga maze no kokebwa ndaba mugamba tifine cha kola saba sajja umuntu wa mazo kufa Mapeda reached a time and loved the Catholic religion this history is found in the book written by Reverend Father J Diba Amnafka Farida reporting The safety of the aviation industry in Africa has drastically improved in performance. Speaking at the gathering of global aviation regulators in Kampala, the Secretary General of International Civil Aviation Organization reports a single safety concern was recorded in 2018. This is up from a record 20 incidences in 2012. Safety and security are two key elements the aviation industry pays much attention to than anything else. Although the implementation to global set standards is something Africa is quickly catching up with. Efforts to match the required safety expectations is part of the reason the 6th African and Indian Ocean Aviation Week is hosted in the capital Kampala, bringing together aviation regulators. Effective pension rate still not a uh satisfactory because it's still uh, below our global average as a whole continent. To authorities in Uganda, the event being held here for a second time is confidence on the country. Safety, security and facilitation are key tenets of the aviation industry and they heavily influence our government policy for the subsector. We could therefore not miss this opportunity to host the two important meetings, given our record and resolve to promote the growth of air transport in the region and in the continent. The continent has made significant improvements with safety concerns reported by International Civil Aviation Organization to have reduced from 20 in 2012 to just one in 2018, whereas security concerns were reduced to two in 2018. But I have to say in the past, um, couple of years, to three and four years, uh, Africa is the um, most uh, fast improving region in the safety and the security uh, implementation of our standards. So it's very promising. ICAO emphasizes on the need for modernization of infrastructure and investment on human capacity as the annual growth figures for Africa alone is projected at about 4.8%. The air passenger traffic is expected to increase to about 7.4 billion travelers by the year 2036. This is an increase from 4 billion travelers currently. What this means is an immense pressure on the African continent, which has to double on the efforts of improving on the security and safety. Onyango Jackson, UBC TV, in Munyonyo. Meanwhile, local exporters have been challenged to embrace equality, equality production to enable easy access to European markets. 
Minister for Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, Amelia Chambade, wants increased production of local uh, products, we, uh, local content rather, with guaranteed quality for export. This was during the opening of a Goa sensitization uh, workshop held at the Ugandan Parliament, also graced by the Speaker, Rebecca Kadaka. In this well-mounted tent, over 70 exhibitors are in here to showcase their merchandise ranging from clothes, shoes, edibles, art and craft, among others. Agnes Kitumba is one of them, dealing in leather products meant for women. It is an initiative she started way back to make senior six holidaymakers occupied, at least before they enrolled for tertiary education. Everybody knows in Uganda that after senior six, it takes you close to 10 months before someone can enroll into university. So the company was started on the basis that instead of someone being idle, they have something to do before the results come back. Slightly different from Kitumba is Joram Atuhamize, the proprietor of Jora Shoes, a company known for making both male and female leather products. Even when he had no shoes, he was inspired by an abandoned shoe in the plantation, which ignited his entry into the venture. I picked them up, I mended them, they became shoes. So one time when I came to Wino, I came to buy shoes, expecting to buy leather shoes, but to my surprise, the guy gave me shoes which were not leather. I went back, I put it on one day, and the shoes got spoiled within one day. Whereas at Hamiza sells his leather products locally, the case is different with the Kitumba, who has read the market overseas. These shoes are sold locally here to the schools, and there are even people who come one-on-one, -on -one, they buy from our shop. We sell mainly in the U.S., but we can, ex Please, we can export anywhere all over the world. They say the rest is history. But for both Agnes Kitumba and Joram at Hamize, there could be a devil in the detail of the saying, high taxes on imported raw materials remain challenging among other shortcomings. So you find that to be able to make a high-end product that you can sell in the U.S. to high-end customers, you have to bring in good raw materials. So raw materials, taxes, are some of the things that we face. We have a lot of competition from the imported shoes because people like cheap things and yet leather because we deal in quality. We deal only in leather which is a little bit expensive so people find them expensive. These are some of the challenges the rejuvenation of the African Growth and Opportunity Act AGOA looks forward to addressing. Uganda like many other African countries has not maximally utilized this initiative due to various constraints such as lack of production of quality products, value addition, standards through the entire value chain, lack of awareness of the AGOA market. If businesses are not aware of AGOA or do not know how to export under its requirements, then Ugandan firms will miss a tremendous opportunity to enhance their competitiveness and boost their exports. Fortunately, AGOA's extension until 2025, there's still time to help firms leverage this trade preference. Both Speaker of Parliament, Rebecca Kadaga, and Minister for Trade, Amelia Chambade, pledged to support foreign trade through embracing AGOA. It's important that you build your quality and quantities through local content, then you're able to export quality. So that is the importance of local content. Already we have been told that uh, there are areas of taxation which are painful to, uh, to the exporters. We told you about uh, uh, Nseko and her difficulty in getting uh, materials, yet we have animals in, in this country. So all those things, uh, only members, are important for us uh, so that we can help uh, improve the environment for Goa and also improve uh, our incomes and those of our people. The African Growth and Opportunity Act, also known as AGOA, is a United States Trade Act 
that was enacted on 18th May 2000. As a public law of the 200th Congress, the legislation aimed at enhancing market access to the U.S. for qualifying sub-Saharan African countries. It was a trade opportunity that Uganda had and still needs to embrace. Henry Okurut, UBC. Donor communities are changing strategy from giving handouts, which is less sustainable, to building self-reliance in the refugee settlements. The new strategy seeks to bridge the gap between humanitarian and development agenda. For long, most of the intervention in the refugee response sector has been on humanitarian aid. According to Regina McKenzie, Director of Economic Growth USAID Mission in Uganda, this is no longer sustainable due to donor fatigue. The three-day market event at Nkoma Grounds in Wamwanja Settlement in Kamwenge District has brought together over 40 private sector enterprises, USID Feed the Future Partners, and thousands of refugees and host community. The initiative is aimed at offering exposure to and knowledge of available services, business opportunities, and inspiration for business ventures, among others. People living here want and deserve to build better lives for themselves and for their families. However, market information doesn't always make it through. Uh, there's limited technology, there are issues with post-harvest losses, and challenges with integrated market markets. All of these things make it difficult for to have reliable incomes. This is an opportunity, it's uh, the f a bit of a first of a kind uh, in terms of uh, resiliency focused uh, interventions for humanitarian populations. For, uh, populations affected by humanitarian emergencies and uh, gives the opportunity to possibly distill and identify a model that could then become replicated more widely for the rest of the really large population of uh, refugees in Uganda. Implemented by AFSI Foundation with support from USID, Graduating to Resilience program aims at ensuring that poor but economically active refugees and Ugandan households in Kamwenge region graduate from conditions of food insecurity and fragile livelihoods to self-reliance and resiliency. People feel more responsible if you help them to build their potential rather than if you replace and start to give them handouts. They feel better when they know that they can get that thing for themselves. Targeting both refugees and Ugandans, the activity is aligned with government of Uganda's rehab strategy. So as we promote peaceful coexistence, we also have to see that they live like how, how the host community lives. So we are not saying that when they become more comfortable, they will not go back home. They did not come to look for food, they came to look for peace. So we hope when peace returns in their countries, they will go back. Wamwanja settlement currently hosts over 60,000 refugees, most of whom are women and children. The refugees are mostly from the Democratic Republic of Congo and a few from Rwanda and Burundi. Nilitoka Congo, Goma. Nilitoka juu ya entre presidential. Ninaangalia business ya ya nini ya ya solar power. Ya solar power itatusaidia kama tukifanya hiyo business. Graduating to Resilience Activity is a seven-year project which commenced in October 2017 until September 2024. It is funded by USID's Food for Peace Office. Uganda is currently hosting over 1.2 million refugees from the neighboring countries such as South Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, as well as Congo. Some of these refugees have ended up staying for so long, and that's where the program such as Graduation to Resilience being spearheaded by AFSI comes in handy. Dennis Igoa for UBC News at From Wanja Settlement Camp in Kamwenge. And the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Cooperative.